All right, so we're done with the break. What do we got now? What fun? <laughs> Practical uses, use of, of EPDs online and submission tips are really what we're going to talk about now. To be honest, it's mainly going to be a lot of the practical use. I've got a neat little book. I picked these up at the Nationals from uh, our National Association uh, for you guys, and everybody has one that talks about how to do the EPD submission. And we'll kind of discuss it a little bit, but uh, most of my slides are on how to use EPDs. So this is a um, illustration, and I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to get you the electronic versions, though. Uh, if anybody wants to run up here and look real close or put your glasses on, feel free. But it's an illustration that was prepared by Mike Safley in some of his presentations that he, he loaned to me. Uh, prices here are in dollars per pound as of June of 2008. So they're a little bit old, but it's a good illustration. And it talks about prices in dollars per pound for different types of fiber from wool to alpaca at various microns. Uh, to cashmere and even vicuna, right? And, it, and they've got alpaca at 26 micron, $8 a pound. Nicole, I don't know if you can confirm or deny uh, current figures. Uh, 26 micron, $8 a pound. Uh, alpaca at 16 micron, 123 a pound. And these are world market figures as of uh, June of 2008. That fascinates me because <clears throat> I've tried to work with 16 micron alpaca. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. But it's, it's there's a very there's a niche market for that. Let's say that domestically, right? But this is more kind of Peru price. You know the the big commercial yeah, market. I was going to say that's not true of the local market. Of the what are the what is it, how does how does it phrase? It's called the uh, um, um, cottage industry. Yeah, yeah cottage cottage industry. industry. Much more than that. But okay, let's. But just using this as an illustration of commercial fiber markets, kind of like you know gold trading on the exchange and that kind of thing, uh, for the it's fiber that worldwide. right, yeah. yes. So an alpaca twenty six micron eight dollars a pound, uh, alpaca at sixteen micron one hundred twenty three a pound. This is kind of interesting because we're going to base the next demonstration on those figures. So alpacas with very fine. I guess going back, you can see that finer microns have a higher value, right? We know that. Uh, maybe, again, not necessarily in the cottage market, yes or no, depending on how you market it. But certainly, if you were to sell your fleece to uh, Lynn Eden's Back 40, for example, the finer micron is worth more than if you sold it elsewhere as a fleece just from a, a fiber standpoint. So now there's a, a, a value in some markets, in this commercial market being an example, of having a reduced micron or a finer micron in your alpaca fleece, correct? We all get that. And these alpacas with finer micron exist. EPDs provide a means to identify those alpacas, not, not the ones with the fine micron, but the ones that can reliably pass on that trait to their offspring. That's what we're looking for. In your breeding decision, I don't care how great that animal is sitting in front of me if it can't pass that trait on. Does that do me any good at all? If there's a, uh, you know, and, and there's all kinds of ways you can make an animal look better than it is genetically, and, and we've heard of some of the things that happen out there. But what we see isn't important if it can't pass that trait along to its offspring. So the EPDs are going to help us to do that, to identify the ones that pass that trait along. This was the graph that, that they came up with. Uh, it, now, again, I'm not trying to advocate that you chase Micron, but as a flight of fantasy to talk about things that you could do. If you were specifically trying to reduce the micron for that economic value we talked about a minute ago, and again, hypothetically speaking, this is a graph that shows how using EPDs, you could, in four generations, take that 28 micron to 16. And what would be the financial impact if you were a world fiber market farmer? Well, in the first generation, where you have um, a 28 micron female worth $8 a pound, you can earn $51 an alpaca a year on 6.4 pounds average, right, is what they have for the example. Now, you breed in the first generation to a 20 micron male in EPDs, 
and you get to 24 micron in generation two, which is $81 in alpaca. And the next one, and, 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 and subsequently you're going down with your various herd sires that you're breeding to. Notice you don't breed to the 14 micron guy every time. You don't have to. To, to have a great dramatic improvement, you could do this economically with your breedings, not necessarily always jump into the top in the nation kind of thing, but improving your females. And what they demonstrate here, and this was something I pulled from one of Mike Safley's presentations, is you could end up with this female at 16 micron, which those exist now too, which on the commercial market, if you could do 16 microns on 15 pounds, that would be 1,845 in alpaca. And if you had 100 alpacas, both male and female, at 1,845, you can make 184,000 a year just selling the fiber on the commercial market. <laughs> yeah, well, unless unless you're doing embryo transplant, which is a whole another story. But absolutely. Yes, depending on depending on how you do your breeding, and of course you, and you have to do a female. Yes, and you have to get a female. So you have to do multiple breedings, right? I mean, this is if you were to breed this class of female with this, oops, this class of male, and you get a female and you go that way. Uh, and, and it's going to be, you remember when we breed, going back to the very beginning, there's four things that contribute to genetic improvement. One of them is the interval, how quickly you can turn around and replace in your breeding program the next generation of animal. Now some people, and, and we know nowadays this is not advised, but some people uh, start breeding females at, at you know, very young, at a year, at one year. And they can shorten up some of these intervals that way. But you know what? We're more responsible with it. It's not necessarily about uh, how quickly we can get from here to here, but it's just demonstrating that in four generations how, you, how what that improvement could look like. And, um, and what you could do with that. If you had consistent improvement of traits with a plan, with a goal in mind, you can accomplish that goal. And you can have economically viable results uh, from that, depending on what your, your goal is. Here's another way of looking at it. Two histograms from, they call him Mr. Ivy League. All the, the names have been blocked out to protect the innocent. Uh, Mr. Ivy League and Mrs. Marilyn Monroe is who we're breeding here, fictitionally. Although these are real histograms. Um, and it's saying basic fiber histogram test results these animals are not related. Would you say it's a good mating based on these stats? Can you guys read that? The stats in the middle? Does that look like an okay breeding? Would you advise against it? Right? But it, you're going to have, remember the female, this male is going to improve her, her uniformity, right? 4.1 to 3.4. Uh, fibers greater than 30. Uh, the male would improve that female, right? So there's some, there's some uh, improvement there. Now, if you look at just the phenotypic, if you look at, and these are actual two actual animals, um, some of the data gets filled in a little bit more, and you look at, okay, so here uniformity goes down, uh, CV goes down, spin fineness goes down a little bit, percent greater than 30, so the, the, the primaries goes down. Um, Staple length improves, a little curvature, you know, and, and then medulation is about the same. So, okay, so it's a little bit more information. We're thinking about whether or not this is, if you had these two on your farm, not, you know, w would that be something you might think about? But then if you look at the EPDs, and the, again, these are two actual animals. On the EPDs, Mr. Ivy League and Marilyn Monroe named Alpaca A and Alpaca B. Turns out, the guy that looked like he could marginally improve the female, he's in the bottom 10% of the herd, EPD-wise. He's one of those that his traits look good. Maybe starvation fineness or who knows what. His traits look good. But when you look at his genetic line and their ability to improve based on production results of that line, he's in the lowest 10% of the national herd. Whereas the female, whose traits weren't quite as good as that male, her genetic line's in the top 1%. So you break down. So you break down big time. The anticipated offspring for that female who was in the top 1% <coughs> is 
is going to be in the top 20 percent. So it's going to be a downgrade significantly genetically. And look at some of these traits where you had a female in top one, one, top 10, top one, top two, top two. You've now got 20, 45, 30, 60, 20. So you definitely, from an EPD genetic production, traits that you can reliably pass along to your offspring, you were a down in a big way. So EPD and accuracy, we, we talked about this earlier, heritability, that's that word we want to talk about. EPD and accuracy are both influenced by the degree of genetic influence on the animal's performance called heritability. And, and this, this description here I pulled from the producer report. Put another way, the differences we observe in animal performance of those differences, what proportion is due to genetic difference as opposed to management or environmental effect? That's what we call heritability. What percentage of the improvement is due to genes or genetics and versus the environment or management? And, and so that's going to be expressed as a percentage from 0 to 100. In livestock, anything below 15% is considered low heritability. Anything above 40% is high heritability. A lot of cattle traits are in the 30s, okay? I'm about to show you the alpacas. Alpacas are highly heritable for many of the traits that we track. In the producer report is a study of heritability and they figure out you know, what, what's most heritable. And what they find is uh, average fiber diameter, uh, uniformity, uh, spin fineness, percent of fibers greater than 30, uh, mean curvature, standard deviation of curvature, medulation, and birth weight. Those are, high, are more highly heritable. What's less highly heritable in alpacas is fleece weight and staple length. Isn't that interesting? So now you know. It's, so it's easier to fix fineness than it is staple length. Interesting. But note that all of these traits, for the most part, are pretty highly heritable. Uh, from a, a livestock standpoint, this is phenomenal. Then that's why we see the degree of improvement in the national herd is so dramatic. I mean, you look at some of the original imports versus some of the judges' choice winners today, and, and sometimes they can look like a whole different breed, almost. I mean, it's like, where did these animals come from? Because they're so highly heritable that improvement can be dramatic. And don't get me wrong, the improvement over the next five years will be more dramatic than the improvement over the last 10 years because of EPDs. So what do EPD values reflect? And this is where we can talk about spin fineness. I'm not going to cover a lot of these. You're going to have this in you. When I give you the digital copy of this, you can review. But it talks about you know, what each one of these mean. What I am going to mention is that some of these traits, and the, the EPD traits kind of mirror the histogram traits, right? But some of these traits are lower is better, and some higher is better. Okay? So micron... Average fiber diameter, AFD, lower is better. Fleece weight is measured in pounds, higher is better. Okay? Uh, spin fineness. Is that the one we were looking at, Nicole? Okay, so it says, I'm going to read this to you guys. This number provides an estimate of the performance of the sample when it's spun into yarn. It combines the measured average fiber diameter and the measured coefficient of variation. The formula used comes from Butler and Doling, fiber people, and, nor and normalizes the equation so the spinning fineness is the same as AFD when the CV is 24%. For some reason, that's a magic number they figured out. This is the same as AFD if CV is 24%, usually less than one micron from the AFD. So that's spin fineness. Doesn't explain it any better than you did before I read that. <laughs> but I will look into it because I find that a, a curious a curious feature that they are obviously making fairly important since it's one of the things that they're identifying, but yeah, I'm just curious. And CV, well, it's not even on here, but um, 
mean curvature, has steve mean curve, medulated fibers, mean staple length, fleece weight. Okay, something interesting I'm just going to throw out there real quickly. Uh, when I talked to Mike Safley, one of the things he mentioned, he said most breeders should be trying to, and the American alpaca breeders should be trying to breed out medulation. That should be one of our number one goals. He said if you breed out medulation, you, you will solve a lot of the other things, like prim primary and secondary is what I'm talking about. Fineness will fix, uniformity will fix, and, and those things. But that you'll end up with a more commercially viable fiber herd, a commercial fiber herd. And, and, and it's interesting because I see some alignment. If you go look at the SRS system out of Australia, anybody familiar with that? The, the SRS system is a breeding system out of Australia. And one of their goals is to less, lessen medulation and improve staple length. So I'm seeing some similarities in, in reports from different people. But what Mike was saying is that med, breeding out medulation from the fiber of our American herd, um, we have like 15 years to do that. And if we don't, if somebody doesn't go after that as a goal, uh, we may lose that opportunity because we will have all the original, some of the animals that have really low medulation because a lot of people aren't even paying attention to it, will be gone to breed to. And we're going to have, you know, the, the mixture of bloodlines that, that, where we can't pull that out, as, tease that out as much. So that, that was kind of interesting. Um, staple length, fleece weight. And I keep reading this everywhere. No matter what the accuracy number is, the EPD for a trait is consistently a better predictor of an animal's genetic merit than its own performance alone. And this is borne out over and over. And people try to say, no, 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 but this animal's awesome. But the EPD's right. Because the EPD, it's not some magic, it's based on performance data. It's based on what's been proven in the past all the way up till the offspring now, you know, by, by analyzing those improvements and those, the amount of improvement in each breeding and each trait, they can tell you that the numbers, the computer didn't lie. It can tell you what the improvement range is going to be for this animal based on all of that previous performance, no matter what you wish could happen. We could wish a lot of things, but the reality is going to be different. The EPD is based on considerably more data than an observation from only an individual. They take into account data from ancestors, collateral relatives, the individual, and progeny, and they adjust for differences in the age of animals at measure and account for nutritional and climatic differences across herds with designated contemporary groups. And that's from Dr. N's EPD producer report. So this talks, we were talking earlier about, it, it adjusts for the differences in age for the, for the animals at measure, it accounts for nutritional and climatic differences. And, and this is through adjustment variables and, and different parts of that BLUP algorithm. So the EPD accuracy ranges. We talked a little bit about that earlier. But let's, let's look at this again, because this is more detailed. So this is, and I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but it's the possible change value. That's a good word to think about. Change value. Another way, another term used in, in sort of formal EPD language would be a confidence value or confidence range, actually. So with EPDs, and this comes in that producer report we're talking about, let's say, well, I've got a sample EPD here. So let's say, for example, you've got an EPD of negative for AFD, I'm just going to use that simple, negative 2.085 with an accuracy of 67%. Let me show you what that really means. So we got an accuracy of between 0.6 and 0.7 and it's uh, the accuracy range for fiber diameter is going to be for that it's probably halfway between these two. So 35 and 47 would be, say 40, 41, 42, 41 is in the middle. And this is closer to the seven than the six. So say 40, you think? Maybe? Or no, no, it's not, maybe three, seven. But we'll say, so, so the accuracy, the confidence range for this particular measurement might be 
and we say maybe 0.39, we'll say 0.39. That's okay, whatever. So what they're saying is that for when you breed a given male and female, and let's say the female is negative 1, 4, 2, 2. 4, 2, 2 is the female. Okay. And her AFD EPD is negative 1.422. This guy's negative 2.085, but his accuracy is 0.67, which gives you a confidence range of 3.9. So what that's saying is, man, I need a calculator. But you could have the range of, of AFD EPD for him will be somewhere between, let me do it this way, 0 0.2085, and it's going to be plus 0.39 or minus 0.39. Somewhere in that range. So has anybody got a calculator? I got a phone. Let's, let's see. Let's run these numbers real quick just to make it real. 2.47? Okay, what about the left? <laughs> Five. That would actually be plus point three nine. Two point four seven five. Oh, you gave me that 2.475, and then, is it 1.69? So, it'll be negative 2.475 to negative 1.69, right? So, that's the confidence range of the contribution, genetically, of the male to the breeding Okay, gosh, I know this is complicated. The, because of the accuracy, the accuracy of 0.67 says, okay, look, his EPD falls here. You know, when I average the numbers out, this is the thing. But the problem is, because you get some genetic, you know, your DNA isn't, isn't like that. It's, there, you get some traits and they, they, they work together to do things. And like, so it says, based on what we've seen from production, you're going to have a range, and your range is based on that accuracy. The middle of that range is this trait right here. So you're, you're going to fall, they say, 67% of the time within that range above or within that range below. But that's the middle. Okay, it's going to be, you've got a range, and this is the middle of your range. It's kind of like micron. When you look at your, um, if you were to look at your histogram, the way the data is really calculated, your fiber, your, well, it is. You see the, the chart in there? The, the fiber... Histogram really looks like this. And your micron is the average fiber diameter, the middle. So when you say 17 micron, 17 is right here, guys. But half of your fibers are below and half are above, right? And this, this range here uh, is, is what you call SD. I don't know if you guys know that. That's the standard deviation, which says... The smaller the SD, the tighter the range around that average fiber diameter, 17. So it's the same thing with your EPDs. So you've got, your guy is going to contribute genetic merit in fiber diameter that's going to hit a range. On this particular one we're looking at, negative 2.085, that's the middle. And the tightness of that range is defined by the accuracy. Does that make sense? Okay. So... In this guy's case, though, here's what you know. Statistically, on this computer, almost guaranteed, I mean, as, as sure as, better than any decision we could make, his genetic merit is not going to be worse than negative 1.69. Because of the accuracy and the mean, kind of like SD and, and fiber diameter, he, he's not going to go below 1.69. Okay, but if we had the same guy with an accuracy of 0.1, what do we got? At point 0.1, your, your confidence range is 1.06. So then if it was point 0.1, it would be, well, it, it could go from, um, 
you could go down to negative 1.085, right? So there, with a lower accuracy of the same EPD, you could get much worse of an offspring or result because your accuracy is not dialed in. So your po range of possibilities is wider. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm. But you just said your accuracy was one point something. No, I said if, if the accuracy was, was point 0.1. Oh, point 0.1. I thought you said one point. No. If the accuracy is point 0.1. Your confidence range is 1.17. Right? So, or or 1.06. And that's where it would be something like this. So that's kind of how the accuracy plays into it. You still know that for EPDs, the, the mean figure, whatever that value is, for a given animal is the average, just like your average fiber diameter is 17, right? But now if you randomly picked a fiber out of that fleece for this animal with, where the average fiber diameter is 17, that fiber is going to come within this range of standard deviation from 17, okay? It's the same kind of thing with EPDs. No matter what the accuracy, your average is still your average but the accuracy does help you dial in to guarantee the output or the production as much as is possible on that trait. Well, that's a lot of complicated science, isn't it? Uh, so that's what accuracy ranges are all about. People, a lot of people don't understand what those are. On your producer report, there's also percentile ranges. Now, this is cool. This is easier to think about than uh, some of the traits. So you look at like a negative two. What does that mean? What does negative two mean? What does it really mean? How can I relate to that? Well, this tells you. So the percentile ranking says as, as your traits rank at certain levels, you're in the top 1% of the national herd, the top 2%, the top 10%, the top 45%, the top 90%. So this negative 2085 guy would be in the top 1%. Uh, the female at negative 1422, and I think this is male, but if we were to assume it was that that was a male, 142 one, four, would be in the top 10%, between 10 and 5, probably around 7 or so. Does that make sense? So using this percentage ranking helps you to, um, to get a better idea of goals, where you're, where you're at, where you want to go, some of those kind of things. You could, for example, I like to look at animals that win at shows and, and figure out where they are in the ranking. Like I've heard some, a lot of people talk about how uh, show crimp and show animals could best be created by taking a, a top uh, one to three percent male and bred to a top fifteen percent female, and that hybrid vigor in the reduced the, the offspring comes out would be great to take to a show. I mean, people talk about stuff like that all the time. So, looking at these percentiles can be very fascinating. What I want you to look at, though, really, is the very minute difference between some of these percentages. To be in the top 3% versus 1%, you're talking about really a third or a quarter of a micron. Genetic difference, is that, I mean, for most of us, is that really that big of a deal? In our breeding programs, to improve our females? I mean, we can, we've got some great females, some of the best females on our farms, and they'll be improved pretty much the same anywhere in that top one to 3% on an EPD basis. Now, you might look at a 3% male, like I've, I've looked at, you might look at a 3% male who's got some other traits that you like, like lingering fineness, or reduction in guard hair, or longer staple, or higher fleece weight. And you may see some of the other traits are way better here than the dude up here, for example. So don't get lured into EPD madness any more than you would micron madness. You know, it, you want to be balanced in all things. And you got to look at what I was just talking about, multiple trait selection. Improvements in one trait can negatively impact another. So if you go after AFD alone, the fiber diameter, you're going to reduce fleece weight. So you want to monitor both uh, instead of a single trait selection. Uh, look for breedings that maintain a number of traits and improve trait combinations you're pursuing. So we looked earlier at the male and female, and, and you know a lot of us said, well, you know, it's, it's a little bit of improvement. But look, it didn't always have to be a home run. Because your EPDs, in some cases, you may be breeding animals with very similar EPDs, but there's a non-EPD trait you want to improve, like conformation or size or density or who knows what. 
the cattle industry maintains indexes of commercially desirable trait combinations. And really, that's how you want to think of it. Don't think of it as a single trait. Think of trait combinations. And one of the, the things that's kind of cool that I hear out of a lot of breeders that have been doing this for a while is they're looking for balanced traits. They're looking for a slate of balanced traits that produce improved animals, improved herds. So it's not always the best to be at the top of one trait if losing other important traits like color or confirmation. So real quickly, I'm going to run through a couple of screens on AOA's website that you can use EPDs and how you can, can use them. One is when you first log in, this is the dashboard that you see. And, and I don't know if you noticed or if you've looked before, but you know there's a search button where you can search for animals. There's a basic search, a detailed search, and an EPD search. And I really want to focus on these two right now. I've actually got a little laser pointer. You want to look at the uh, uh, the detailed search it allows you to do some really cool stuff. Really cool stuff. Say for example, you want to find a male that has e EPDs within a certain range that you need to improve a trait that has offspring that are colored bay black, for example. Right? You can do that search. Uh, which one is this? So this, okay, I'm going to go back. Over here you've got EPD search. That's the first one I'm going to show you. You can do an EPD search. So here I did a search for, and make sure you active because dead animals don't do you any good, right? You can't breed those. Active Wakaya in my search, male. And I don't care about any of the colors or anything. I said older than two because if you want to breed them now, you know, a two year old doesn't do you much good. Uh, with average fiber diameter less than negative one eight. So if I'm looking for, in this case, I, I was looking at a female who has an AFD of negative one eight, and I was looking to breed to a male with AFD less than one eight, and I want the accuracy dialed in, right? Because I want to know that I'm going to see an improvement. It's never going to be lower than 1.69 if with that accuracy. And so if I know it's not going to go lower than 1.69, and I'm breeding a girl, I think it's like 1.7 or something, that was, I said, okay, it's not going to be, at least the offspring is not going to be a downgrade for that female. That's how you want to think. You want to look at your accuracy ranges and look at everything and say, okay, when I breed this male to this female, the offspring will be as good as the female or better. I'm not going to take a step back in my program. It's going to be a step forward. So I was, I was engineering that kind of search, and, out of, and believe it or not, this is how cool EPDs are. Out of this very detailed search came up with exactly 14 results of males that are good candidates to accomplish those goals for that trait. And then I can go look at those males and I can see, okay, which one of those best fits my program and my breeding decisions and that kind of thing. So this is how you can use these. In another search, uh, I'm looking here, gosh, what was I doing? Okay, offspring of color, I was looking for color, medium fawn. This is the detailed search we were talking about. And in a detailed search, I did an active, again, because dead animals don't help me, Wakaya male breeder. I could have done primary color, country, age. Uh, but I said, I want a male with medium fawn offspring. So he has passed medium fawn on to his Korea. And I want one that's well used, so he's got strong EPDs, more than 70 total offspring male. A male has been used in this search that I was doing with an average fiber diameter less than negative 1.8 and, and actually 0.6 because I wanted to peg the worst animal I could get. And it came back with 11 results in that search. So you can look at those and then you go do your other stuff. You look at confirmation, you look at pedigree, you look at price and availability, and you identify which herd sire could best meet your needs. Um, in this other search, yeah, this is the Bay Black one I was doing. So I did a search for um, active Wakaya male Bay Black with, and because Bay Blacks aren't as fine as whites, you know, you don't have as many Bay Blacks up there. So I did AFD less than negative one. So I want any Bay Black that has genetically improves their offspring one micron better than the herd average. And it came back with a list of 12. And this is the one I was talking about. We've got one that's number three on that list. And he's not in, he's not in the top 10%. I mean, he is in the top 10. He's not in the top 3%. He's not, well, going back to the percentages before, remember we said 1.4 
was probably 7% or so. So he's in the top 7%, but he's the number three bay black male EPD wise in the nation. So don't get caught up on that top 1% stuff. Depending on color and breed and everything else, it, you may be in the top 1%, even if you're in the herd, your, your color may be the top. You may be the best breeding decision to improve animals of that color and, and not be anywhere near the top. 1%. And so your goal necess shouldn't always necessarily be targeting that top 1%. It's just targeting systematic you know, improvement toward your goals, whatever those are. There's also a mate selector tool. This one's complicated. This one confuses people. There, there's people online on, on Pack of This and all that, that have tried this and, and they get these weird results and they say, well, that's why EPDs are useless. I can't use EPDs because of this result. And it's wrong. What they did is they loaded up because you're supposed to take 100% and divide out, based on what's important to you on traits, what you want to look for. So they, you know, you got AFD, SDAFD, you know, mean staple length, fleece weight, medulation. And you're supposed to take that 100 and divide it out. But what people do wrong is they come in and they just put 100 on AFD. And then you get this animal that's, that's you know, got like three years. It's got the traits are all over the place, but it's the finest. But you've you've told the the search that you don't care about you know uniformity, that you don't care about fibers greater than thirty, that you don't care about fleece weight or staple length or curvature. And so guess what? It gives you what you asked for. The finest animal. Oh man. So what? But if you decide to use this tool, balance it. That's all. Just balance it, and you'll get the best results that way. Then, if you don't get what you want, tweak the numbers a little bit and, and see what kind of better results you get. I don't particularly like this tool because when I'm online searching and stuff, it's hard to use. The results you get on the other one that we did a minute ago, you know, that where you do a search for a trait and, oh, I need to go back and show you something. But, okay, so let me show you real quick. On this one, there's no clicks, there's no links. I can't link through to the animal. There's not even animal names. There's there's area numbers. So on this one, I've got to write the numbers down and then go do another search to find the animal. And it's horribly slow when you're trying to go through a lot of animals looking for one you want to try to find a breeding to or something like that. So to me, this one's hard to use. Um, but if I'm going to go back, like on this one, for example, okay, something I got to show you. So on this one, we do this search, but remember when I said you don't want to look for just one trait, you want to do trait trait combinations, your own kind of trait index, whatever's important to you. So maybe staple length, maybe fleece weight. But let's say that you identify, okay, I want AFD within this range. So you can say AFD in this range. And, and, and look, if that's your primary trait, I want to stay within this range. I know that my female is negative one four. I like where she is. So I want to be maybe negative one to negative two. I want to stay in this range. So you do your AFD search, it's going to come back with a group of alpacas, right? But then you can sort this list by a second trait by clicking on the title, the column title. So what I do a lot of times, and, and actually here, I'm doing it here. I think I'm doing, yeah, I think I am. Um, on this particular search, I've got fineness. I, I wanted everything less than negative one because I knew that was the range. I knew that Bay Black didn't go very fine. So from negative one to as fine as you go is good for me and the search. But then what I did is I sorted by fleece weight. So it'll give you the finest animals and adjust by fleece weight or staple length or curvature if you're into crimp and that kind of thing. So you can use the the sort tool here, that heading sort or medulation is a good one too, to, to take animals within a certain range where you want to maintain that, that range in your herd and you can tweak some of the other traits and, and have it come up that way. And that's pretty cool that not a lot of people know about. So like I said, this one, if I go back and show you real quick on this other one that we were looking at, see these links? You get animal names, so I know breeder IDs, I, I know a lot just by the name. But then I can click on that and I can come back and I can click to the next one, I can come back. But on, on the mate selector tool, unfortunately, it's kind of hard to work with. Um, but it's there. Just if you use it, make sure it's balanced on your percentage so you can get the best results. And this is one so that you would, while we were talking about EPDs, I wanted you guys to have a list of EPDs to look at, kind of to understand some of this stuff. But this is a breeding that we did in our herd, and it was a female being improved by a male, and you can see by these traits, 
uh, her, her fiber density or fiber diameter, I mean, and his and some of these other traits where uh, in the different areas we were looking to improve the result, and I mean, I'm not going to bore you with the science of it. We could go through the accuracies and the confidence ranges and show that we know we're going to get certain traits from the offspring within this range and this range that is acceptable for an improvement of this female by that male in our program. For us, for our goals. It's going to be different for everybody. For some of the non-tracked traits that aren't in the EPDs that, that we're hoping to get, I mean, those are an improvement for us as well. That, we're, that we know and, and plan for. So you want to look at all aspects of it, but definitely you can use these EPDs to guarantee that you're seeing systematic improvements in your herd with each breeding decision in ways you never could just by looking at animals. So some things you want to do with your own EPDs. AOA does not archive like I, I mentioned to you previous years, so uh, download your herd report every year, save it to your computer, uh, then you want to find other herds that specialize in the traits you're looking for and monitor those lines. I mean, you can use EPDs to identify lines. Remember, it's historic and future. And so it's a great way to research uh, who, you want to, um, um, who you want to help you take your herd to the next level. Uh, yeah, you know what? And, and, and here's what's really cool here that, that, that we kind of alluded to earlier. Find these herds that have the traits you want to improve in your herd call them up and ask them if they have any fiber males. Because a lot of times, you know, as herd sires, they're only going to pick the top 1%. Like they'll have their top boy or something like that. But they may have a fiber male that to them, maybe the ears aren't right, or maybe the color's not right for their program, or there's some other thing that's just not a good fit for their program. And so they're selling them as a fiber male, but his EPDs and, and other, you know, confirmation and bloodlines and, and all everything else looks good, the crimp and, and the density and, and you're like, wow, I can improve my herd dramatically that way. You could have huge gains in the in systematic improvement of your herd using EPDs that does not cost you an arm and a leg. So this, this level is a playing field for small breeders. Um, publish all your EPD data. There's no telling who wants what you have. And they can't find you if they don't know you're out there. Um, and then I told you a little bit about how we, we searched and, and found a very specific female that we were looking for across the country. Uh, and, and in your case, the person looking for animals on your farm could be a color, could be a, a, a bloodline, could be a specific trait. Like, you know, who knows? Who knows? But put it out there because they can't find it unless you got it. And to be honest, you don't know. I mean, they may be looking at, I've got a male, and if I could find a female like this... I could breed her to my male and produce that. And, and so they may be looking for a, a specific combination of traits that you don't even know. Uh, okay, so Sopra Salpaca Farm, Corey Wesson, they were an interesting story. They, Corey and I talked uh, a year and a half ago, and they were in the business three years at this time. They, they use EPDs on all their animals. They publish their EPDs. They get a call out of the blue from a large farm in Ohio, of all places, that has been in the business for 19 years, who came to them because they saw a true black girl ranked highly in several EPD categories. Uh, they ended up buying that, that female from them, and he said the coolest thing is they paid list price. They didn't haggle because it was exactly what they needed for their program, and they knew it. Uh, so people are buying based on finding animals in EPDs. It's happening all over the country. Mike Safley was telling me that he keeps hearing breeding, breeders all the time tell him about how many of their animals are being sold solely through published EPDs. I mean, use this thing. Abs you want to be where people are looking. Uh, many successful breeders in the alpaca and other livestock industries will tell you they have great success because of EPDs. And there is, uh, I mentioned before, I was talking to one large uh, breeder from, I mean, been in the business almost from the beginning that said even the lowest quality alpacas could be brought into the top 10 to 20 percent. He said with three generations of EPD guided breedings, but without EPDs you're chasing your tail. And we were talking about a minute ago, fiber males cold due to ear size or head shape may have top 10 to 20 percent EPDs that could improve 80 percent of the females in this country.
And we talked about debunking myths. So one of them was the, do we have enough samples in the program? Absolutely. Uh, the other is because of the distributed nature of the national herd, uh, the EPD system automatically cancels out attempts to cheat. Okay, so now we're at the very end. The, everybody has this book, Guidelines for Preparing and Submitting Fleece Samples for EPD. I wanted that. You were talking about the tools off the AOA website. Um, and you had shown one example where you said, if I take this male and breed it with this female, this is what my expected outcome is. Where do you get that expected outcome? Because I couldn't find any tools that actually showed that. It would be really nice if they would put a calculator up there that did that. Because then you can put in males and females and do some pretty cool stuff. The, the rule, best rule of thumb is to take the females' EPDs and the males' EPDs and average them. And that will give you a general approximation. Uh, the EPD system itself is going to give you a more dialed-in EPD afterward. But as a rough rule of thumb, that's going to be um, a, a excellent breeding decision You know, for the majority of the time. That's the way to do it. Now, if you really want to get fancy with it, you do what I did here. You take the EPD, you use the accuracy, you determine the confidence range, and you look at the confidence range of the two, and then you know you average those two confidence ranges, and you say, okay, my, I'm going to be between here and here. But really, that's a lot of work. But, but the, the rule of thumb is to average the mean, which is the EPD value of each animal. It would also be very interesting to see, you know, if you do that before the breeding, and then once the animal is got its EPD, see how close you actually. And there's people that are doing that right now, which is neat. Jay, is that probably the best? You and I are, are on completely different planets. Yes. If you're on Mercury and I'm on Pluto, if that's still a planet. <laughs> um, it's not. But if I'm going to sell animals to someone, and they come to me and they want to do breeding. And they pick Fluffy Muffin because they like Fluffy Muffin's top knot. What is the Reader's Digest version? How can I help somebody who doesn't have a master's degree in statistics do this? Because the people I'm selling to are not people who are going to have the energy or the time to go into what you're doing, but at the same time, as a responsible farm owner, I want to make sure that I'm giving them, because see, now these are my animals. Yes. My animals' EPDs are being affected by the breeding choices that they're making. Mm -hmm. But they can't hurt your EPDs. They, they will just help dial them in. But yeah. But I want to make sure that it's... You want to help them. Benefit yes. And their benefit. yes. 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 Yeah, obviously. Yeah. So, is simply taking all of my, let's say my males, and computing quick averages on a few of the traits yes. enough to give us a general direction to head in. Well, absolutely. And I, and I would um, say that you might even have three profiles. If your purchaser wants to do fiber products, then uh, you might focus on staple length. And maybe the fineness is okay, so you don't really need to improve fineness, but you want to improve staple length maybe, um, or fleece weight. You know, more fleece, you can make more stuff. Uh, if they want to go to shows, you, maybe you focus on uniformity. You know, so maybe a couple of different profiles based on what they're looking for. Uh, if, they, if it's more pet, then maybe your focus is a non-EPD trait, color, right? And, and you say, okay, so if you, this is the, the one you're buying, and if you breed to these males based on the, um, tr based on the historical performance of the male, you know, uh, he, this male is better at doing, improving this, this male is better at improving this, this male can pass this. You know, we can hit these different traits and position this animal for different markets, improve the offspring. And you always want every breeding to improve for some purpose. Right. You know, As opposed to just looking at pedigrees and saying, well, these two aren't related, so they can go together. Yes, yes, exactly. What's happening. Yeah, and, and I know, I know, no, I know, I know. And I'd like to encourage them to be a little bit more intentional about their breedings without facing them with lots of number crunching. Well, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, they don't have to understand. A lot of people say don't even try to understand EPDs. Just trust that it, that it works. And, 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 and I get that, but I want you guys to understand because I want you to 
to believe it. You got to know something to believe it. And, and really, the, the way to explain it, though, in a simple way would be, okay, the industry has said, based on the production of this line, that this line is better at improving this trait, this line's better at improving this trait, and this line's better at, at giving color, for example. And, and then let them choose, you know, and say, if you go here, you're probably going to get this. If you go here, you're going to get this. And say, and, and no, if we improve uniformity for show on this animal, it's probably going to reduce your fleece weight and your staple length a little bit, depending on, um, you know, how we, because uniformity improvement it, it also results in micron improvement and other stuff. Um, and so if, if they're more apt to show in fleece shows, fleece weight's important. If they're more apt to show in halter shows, fleece weight, I mean, you want density, but fleece weight isn't as important. It's really up until now at my level, it's been, you know, does he throw boys or girls? Right. right. And is he related to my girl? <laughs> and what color am I going to get? Absolutely. You know, those are the top three questions I get when people come to me for breeding. Absolutely. And I would love to, without frightening those people away, which the obvious way to do that would be to raise the stud fee, because that changes the dynamics instantly. Yeah. But um, it would be nice to be able to give them a more scientific choice to make without overwhelming. And what if the GAA farm members got together and on all the various males that we have at our farms, we say, I've got this, I got this, and we have like a, a spreadsheet, and we trade. That would be great. That we just let each other know what we've got. I may not yeah. have anything you guys are interested in, yeah. but it would be great if I knew what you had and you knew what I had. And yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, and that's what the, the whole EPD thing is, is making that information available to everybody. So if we all publish our EPDs, for example, then, I mean, it'd be great if we did it on the website, but even if we didn't, you might look and say, okay, hey, wait a minute, Michael's got this mail. It's really good at improving this trait. I don't have one of those. Yeah, I didn't know you had that. Can I come? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it would, it would be, I mean, it benefits everyone to be able to choose that idea closer. Yeah. You know, if you can go to counties over, to get, or even across the state, that's still better than Ohio. Yes, than or, finding the one that you want in Washington. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's not going to work for a lot of people. No. And how cool would it be to know based on scientific data from past performance and production data and everything else, to know that Michael's male will improve the breeding of whatever female you're looking at based on the numbers that are, that are out there before you get out there, rather than rolling the dice and saying, maybe. Just make it, I mean, I don't see where it would be, it wouldn't be difficult, I don't think, yeah. to just say, okay, everybody, when you get your EPD rate results back, when you print that report, send the GAA a copy. We'll put it on the web page. Yeah. I mean, that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, we were, when we first got into this, we weren't told this based on EPDs, but we were told, okay, we have bred this female to this male expecting this outcome. Uh, your question was, you know, how do you sell now? If you already tell them, listen, you love this animal, it's bred to this male, which ought to give us this, instead of trying to let them pick when they really don't know what most new buyers don't know what they want. Well, no, but I'm, you lost. know, a lot of times they're, when they buy a girl who's already bred and they get a rebreed right. and they come back yeah. mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they don't know. Right. They've never done this before. So it's fun to, it would be fun to be able to say to them, okay, now that you've had a year or six months with these critters, what are you thinking you want to do? What direction do you want to head in? Nothing's written in stone. You can do it differently next time, blah, blah, blah. But it would be good for me to be able to have those numbers so that in the back of my head I could steer them in a positive direction and never breed down. Exactly. Oh gosh. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, you look. You can. There's an EPD for that. <laughs> no, but you know, honestly, you could even have, like, okay, if, if for whatever your purpose, we can do an improved breeding to one of these males, if you want to improve this, this, or this, one of these three. But if you want to go even better than for, for well, for an upcharge of X amount, mm -hmm. you can go even better, you know? Mm -hmm. So almost like any other business where you have these options, you can go elite. So if you want to do, if you want to have an improved breeding, if you want an offspring better than mom, 
do one of these three for one of these traits. If you want to, to go dramatically better, then, you know, you got, you got one of these other decisions that you could do and, and give people options, but in a simple way. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. For those animals that have no EPD data at all, right. does that really mean that none of their ancestors or, you know, any related family tree has any EPDs in there? Well, there, there's two issues here. One is you can have an animal, a lot of animals in, in the North American herd right now have EPDs, but you can't see them because they're not published. But if it's my animal. But if it's your animal, uh, if there's no EPDs on the animal in the database, it likely means mom and dad don't have EPDs. And so if you look at mom and dad, do they have published EPDs? Okay, so the mom and dad's has to be published in order for mine to show up? In order for an animal to be entered in the database without you submitting the data, I think so. I think so. But she could submit the data whether, regardless of But then if I submit data on that animal, then it will take into account their information for my calculations on... Even though it's not published. Even though it's not published. Yes. Okay, I just can't see what theirs was. Right. Got it. And that's, that gets into a fun game because I don't have a shot here for you, but what, what I've done a lot of times where mom and dad or one of the parents, the EPDs aren't published, I'll look at an offspring's EPDs and I'll look at the one that is published and I calculate what the other one is, even though it's not published. So a lot of times if you want to find the EPD of an animal, look at the offspring and especially if you have an offspring and a mom, you can find out a male's EPDs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fascinating to me. And why we haven't heard more about EPDs and why we don't, we're not talking about this all the time is, is what fascinates me more than anything because it's just, it's so simple. I mean, I'm giving you the long version of everything, but at the, at the heart of it, you know. At the heart of it, here's what it is. It's that, exp when you read the breeding books, right, there's the, you can breed based on pedigree or phenotype, which is how they look, or you, the most reliable before EPDs is what's called progeny testing, right? Where you look at the offspring of mom and dad and you see how does the offspring compare? Is it an improvement over mom and dad? And, 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 and that dad, how does he work with other moms? And you can look at the offspring and get an idea of the improvement, right? At the end of the day, e that's all EPDs are but at a scientific, more massive scale than our brains could ever comprehend with such accuracy. Can you yeah. see a, is there a place in the EPD tools to go and say, show me this male and show me all the offspring's EPDs, or do I have to go and manually figure those out? I keep begging for stuff like that. I mean, yeah, that, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah, I know. I mean, there's a lot that they, they still need to do that they don't know, and they're working on it. But what's there is phenomenal. That's just data. That's just programming a screen. Well, I don't know. I went in and I looked up the males, and they showed the offsprings, and then you can click on each offspring, and it takes right. you to the yeah. You just have to do right. each offspring, and then you could just go back right. and click on the next one and look. Yeah. But that was, I'd love to just like have one big chart. You just got yourself a new job. You <laughs> <it>. <laughs> well, let me throw out another tip real quick while we're talking about it. If you see an animal on another farm and, and they have EPDs, and this is an animal of interest, we all have those animals we target, animals of interest, do a screenshot. Because I've tracked animals and I knew their EPDs and they unpublished them. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I wish I should have should have taken a screenshot. So make sure you get screenshots, especially if they're your bloodlines. Well, if, if it's your... Well, and here's what happens a lot of time, they got two animals very similar and one's got better EPDs, and they hide it so that they can still market both animals. Or keep the better one and, and sell the lesser one. You know. But yeah, and so if you see animals you like, um, get the EPDs. Save them quickly. Um, let me see what else we got here. Okay, good. So this is the last slide. Um, guidelines for preparing, submitting flea samples for EPD analysis. The book really walks you through it. Uh, we talked about the main tips, you know, which is getting the weight before and after for the, uh, the weight component. Uh, it's got to be turned in by August 1st. Don't submit anything, any animals, any creas under nine months of age at time of testing. 
Uh, so if it was eight months and three weeks, then, you know, you know, you have to slip a week. Um, and, and really it's, it's all very simple, very self-explanatory. Melissa, any other thoughts? You, you've actually been the one to submit ours. Anything complicated about it? Just follow the instructions. That's it. But it, it involves so that means your, don't let a man do it. They don't read instructions. No, and have all your data. It's frustrating if you have to keep getting up and looking, you know, yeah. to input. So it, it basically, you go on the AOA website. There's a form you fill out. You print out the paper that it, it'll give you a piece of paper. You print out the paper. When you send in your sample to Yoko McCall, you shove the paper in the sample bag, and they do the rest. So that's it. And that's it for EPDs for today. So like I said, we're going to have this breeding strategy seminar coming up in June. And it, the John Heisey, who's going to be teaching this one, uh, has been using EPDs from the beginning. He's taught some of the articles on the AOA uh, website where they have an EPD learning library. Uh, some of those were written by John Heisey. Uh, he's written EPD articles for Alpaca Magazine and all that. So I'm sure he'll have more info. If, if you have any questions or uh, further thoughts that he could answer. But um, for now, that's all I got. If you guys don't have any questions. Woohoo!